good morning. So good to have you all here this morning on this patriotic weekend. I um, am grateful for Matthew Canizio coming and playing our recently, as of like 10 o'clock last night, refurbished piano. <laughs> he says he insisted that it be fixed before he play. Now, we, uh, we had several people commenting on how aged and stiff the piano was becoming. And so we hope this is getting it a little bit closer to playable for uh, many different artists. So it's very good. Thank you, Matthew, for filling in and uh, doing the lovely music that you've chosen for today. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalists of Transylvania County. No matter who you are, whatever brought you here today, whether you've come back again and again or are still new to this place, we welcome you. We are glad that you are here. Our mission is to support individual spiritual journeys and to promote social, economic, and environmental justice. I have a few announcements. One is, of course, we are closed on Tuesday for the national holiday. And that also means that we will not be having fellowship on the green, the picnic that we often have week to week, a chance for people to informally just drop in at lunchtime. There is a team meeting night on the calendar for this Wednesday, July 5th. So those of you who are part of the teams that usually meet on team meeting night, we should make sure we have some agendas figured out. Next Sunday will be Super Sunday, and so we want to tempt you to be back here again and to linger afterwards for a lovely meal, and thank you to those people who are signing up or willing to sign up to bring the soup for that uh, lovely meal after church. Today you get coffee, and I saw little, little cupcakes and other delicacies as well. Uh, this month is the month to sign up at a discounted rate for the UUTC Mountain Retreat. The mountain is, what, an hour and 15 minutes from this parking lot? And it is a gorgeous retreat center. Uh, this is one of the views from the Meditation Rock. And uh, we hope that those of you who went last year will keep talking up how good it was to be part of the circle that attended. Our worship service the second weekend of September will be from the mountain. So if you realize this is where we'll be, uh, please sign up this month. I'll transition now with uh, Michael's help to the candles uh, this morning. I see one lit, but we, and we will start with one. Uh, and I am so sorry, I did not hear of this until just now. Um, Tim McCann passed away. I knew that he was in hospice and I had visited fam family there. He, three of his brothers had come into town. The room was full of, of love uh, as I uh, did a prayer there, but I did not realize he has now passed away and we have a candle for that. And Krista had already lit a candle of joy because her niece, Becca, is visiting her. Congratulations. I'm so glad that you get to have that visit. Are there other joys or sorrows? Um, a sorrow. For those of you who didn't hear, John says that the candle of sorrows for Janice Cannon, who lost her dog, Riley. Uh, and I know, too, um, how close Janice was to her pets. Other sorrows or joys? I'm going to start with Roberta and then move forward.
Happy birthday to Glenn's mother, turned 97, is, I think the word you used is chipper. Uh, <laughs> this is wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Christine. Lots of folks here echoing what uh, was said here. Christine, grateful for the Music Center and all of its programs, and uh, remembering most recently La Traviata yesterday. Alice. Alice is uh, having a candle due to being disturbed by the Supreme Court rulings, especially the bogus wedding website discussion that just occurred, which leaves our LGBTQ folks in fear. <clears throat> yeah. Jean. A candle of thanks for Alice Wellborn. Well done and you're done. <laughs> For those at home who didn't hear that, Jean was saying, thanks for Alice Wellborn, job well done, and you're done. Uh, to recognize that as of July 1st, Ian has now taken over the, the president's position and uh, all the responsibility. The board, I, I do want to say the board last night had a wonderful uh, it was to be an outdoor picnic. The weather changed too quickly for that. Um, we had a wonderful picnic and a uh, tribute to all of those who were rotating off the board. Thank you to all who stepped forward to serve this congregation. And for those who are coming on and just starting new in your positions, thank you as well. Donna. And where was it that you were volunteering, Donna? Sharing. Sharing House. Yeah, and um, I'll say more at the at the, the time of our collection. But uh, uh, Donna is grateful for all who have contributed to the Dignity Project. All of our partnerships in the community with the various nonprofit ser service agencies, and in your case, Donna mentioning the Sharing House, um, the feedback that people give for what we do through our Dignity Project in the community. Thank you, Donna, for lifting that up. With all of these, th oh, Roberta, you have another. Yeah. So the people here are applauding those who volunteered, helped in the community for a wonderful fundraiser for women and girls scholarships. Um, 34,000 uh, raised from the AAUW book sale. And uh, we do, we do pitch in in this community. Thank you. We have a lovely tone. To... <laughs> Susan.
So the quick version. Uh, <laughs> Elizabeth and River are doing River's Bucket List um, due to her brain cancer. Um, they're in Utah at the moment, and um, they're going to connect up with folks at Yosemite on July 4th. Thank you all for what you have shared. Oh, we have another one. Would everybody, please, because I'm going to keep trying to stop. Everybody <laughs> raise your hands. Everybody raise your hands. Everybody. I just said everybody. This is good. We all have cares and sorrows. OK, now, only the people who still want to share their joys and sorrows leave your hands up. OK. Those of you who put your hands down doesn't mean you don't have joys and sorrows. It means you're going to have to wait to coffee hour. <laughs> OK, Victoria. This is wonderful to have your son show up just for the day for your 75th birthday. That's very good, Victoria. All the things that we share, we lift up into community, the joys and sorrows, and it helps build our community strength. Because we know more about the humanity of each other. We carry in our hearts something of the burdens of others to help lighten the load, and are lightened by knowing the joys of everyone around us. Let the glow of these candles remind us of that throughout this service. And now, would you turn to one another and greet one another in respect? Now I've got another one. Yes, the bell is quite eager this morning. Here are opening words from George Kimmich Beach. Giver of being and freedom, thou who touches our lives in unforeseen ways, who unsettles our ease, and who upsets our self-satisfactions. We wait in these moments of stillness to let the hidden processes of healing and growth do their silent work within us and to let the quiet work of reconciliation be renewed among us. Because we know that the ultimate issues of life, healing and growth, reconciliation and renewal, cannot be forced neither by excess of activity nor tumult of words. We seek out this stillness. We seek the quiet, the resting place of our restless hearts. Because we live in mystery, we trust that which is deeper than we know, which touches our hearts, which steadies us and rekindles our spirits, which finally in faith may be named the love that has laid hold upon us and will not let us go. Come, let us worship together. Now the uh, opening hymn is number 153, Oh, I Woke Up This Morning, and the words are on the screen. Please rise and join us as you can. <laughs>
chalice lighting, words are on the screen, and I'd like you to join me in unison. This is the words of Tracy Bleakney, and you might want to listen carefully to these because they raise some of the issues that were raised here this morning by Alice and others about the sort of things that are going on today. Here we go. This chalice burns with twin flames. The first flame burns for those who seek and defend the right to be a free and responsible search for truth and meaning so that each person may live according to his conscience in a democratically elected society. The second flame burns for the defenders of freedom working against those who would impose their own religious beliefs on others through intimidation or legislation. Are always ever vigilant and courageous in the struggle for freedom and justice for all. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kevin Lausch, and I get to work with the kids and youth here at UUTC. And while this morning we might be a little um, shy of those who are young, we have everyone who's young at heart. And that's good. Well, this morning I wanted to talk a little bit about flags. And as you might know, this flag, we're coming up on the 4th of July, I wanted to see um, who all knows a little bit of history of this flag? So first off, and you probably know this one easily, how many stars? 50 stars, that's right. How many stripes? 13 stripes, very good. And why 13? For the original 13 colonies, exactly. How many red and how many white stripes? <laughs> Seven red, six white, exactly. And so the American flag originally had 13 stars. Um, there are stars in a circle on a field of blue. Being the circle meant everyone, all those colonies, was equal. We're going to come back to that equal part in a little while. And we also that had 13 stripes, too, um, but they were just on one side. And the myth was Betsy Ross sewed the first flag, though from a little bit of reading, it seems that the ideas for the flag came from many different colonies, many different parts, and the original colonies all had their own flags, but this one was eventually adopted with the 13 stars in 1777, and um, the colors meant something very specific. Red meant for valor, bravery, on the field of battle over those eight years of the Revolutionary War. White meant for purity. And you have to think about that a little bit too, as in, was it the purity of our thoughts and beliefs, or was it the white, the purity of our skin and where people came from? And blue meant loyalty. Loyalty to the country, loyalty to the flag, and loyalty to the beliefs of independence and freedom but independence and freedom only for a certain few. Later on um, in 1818, new stars were added and as new states came into the union, new stars were added and added and added up to the 50 that we have today. And during the 4th of July, this flag I think is important. It's important every day, it represents our country, it represents the ideals that we aspire to, what we hope our country can be. But I'd like to say we can't use this flag as a block, use this flag as wrapping us into it and excluding others. We can't use the flag as a border or a wall. So I want to represent or bring up another representation, another flag. Anyone know what this flag is? The rainbow flag, the pride flag. Um, this is basically a symbol for LGBTQ plus inclusion, diversity, and pride. It means that whoever you are, whatever you are, however you think of yourself and your identity and your gender and who you love, you are included and welcomed. And there's a neat history to this flag too. 
I didn't know exactly where it came from, but found out it was originally designed in San Francisco by the artist Gilbert Baker, and it was done so by the first supervisor uh, in San Francisco. Um, this was the city supervisor who was openly gay, and his name was Harvey Milk. This is a smart crowd here today. <laughs> and that was done um, in 1778, and over the years it had... No, 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 wait, 1978. <laughs> Very smart crowd, thank you. 1978. And over the years, it has been updated, but originally it was to include basically all those colors primary in the rainbow to represent everybody, everyone, and who you loved, and how you loved, and how you thought of yourself. And actually, they said originally had kind of a hot pink stripe on the top, too. That was later dropped because hot pink cloth was really hard to come by and they could only get so much. Um, and years later, it got to be included and updated a little bit more. And this originally, I think, came about in 2017 and 18, including the rainbow colors of equal on the sides here. And then the chevrons were included, including chevrons for people black and brown skin who are often marginalized and excluded and were treated so badly in our society, including like a white, a pink, and a blue to include gender equality and gender diversity also. And this was adopted in I think it was about 2018. There are um, many different flags like this, but they all basically mean that you are included and the reason I bring up these two flags is I want to say they are not the same, but they're good and needed in our society in so many different ways. There are some people out there who might want to use this flag more as like a bludgeon, a club, to say us, not you, to say we belong and they don't. But I want to add that those folks they might want to sometimes defend what our country did in the past. They might even want to defend its racism, defend slavery, defend it, exclusion of others and say somehow maybe if they're not defending it, it wasn't so bad, was it? You can't depend on the people who are the landed people, the wealthy people, the people with rights, the males, to say if it was so bad or not. You have to ask every. And so what we have to remember is we can't wave this flag if it discriminates, if it excludes, if it says white only or male only or straight only or the gender only that you are assigned when you were born. Some people might call that um, pale, male, and Yale, meaning the upper echelons. Um, it ex excludes and does not include. What we have to do is we have to say that it has to include everyone. It has to stand on the side of love. If we have a symbol, it has to mean everybody, not us and them. So I'd like to suggest as some people wave this flag and say they're a patriot. I'd like to suggest a patriot is someone who loves their country and wants to change it to be the very best that it can. It's been said of African Americans, they're the ultimate patriots because they won't stand by and let our country be less than equal, to be less than fair, to be less inclusive of all. So this 4th of July, let's all be patriots. Let's work to make our country the very best that it can be, and we can stand on the side of love for everybody. Thank you, Kevin. I don't think I need to preach after that. <laughs> but we do need to have an offering. We always have the chance for generosity in this congregation, the chance to give. As mentioned earlier, each month we have a special project. We give money to help support this month, the beginning of the month. I'll tell you a little bit extra about the Dignity Project, which takes its name from our Unitarian Universalist principle of the inherent worth and dignity of each person. Um, it inclu it, that includes deliveries of menstrual hygiene products, diapers, dental health products, condoms, baby wipes, soap. It all began in January of 2018, and all of these are items which our neighbors desperately need 
in order to fully feel their worth and dignity. I don't know the current statistics, but a past year's tally showed that we had purchased and dispersed 200 toothbrushes, 100 bars of soap, 50 bottles of shampoo, 50 razors, 168 tubes of toothpaste, 800 condoms, 65 boxes of tampons, 42 packages of baby wipes, and 6,878 diapers. And without our partners in the community, such as Sharing House, there's no way we could equ equitably distribute these items. We are very, very grateful for the work that these agencies do in our community. If you would like to give specifically for our special collection, please make sure that those funds go into the envelopes in the basket, and anything loose in the basket will be for this congregation. We now receive the morning offering. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Bonnie. All that's given in love, we receive with great joy, and we say, thank you. I have a reading this morning, which goes on forever. It was from a really great sermon from 1830 by William Ellery Channing, addressed to the governor, vice governor, and legislature in Massachusetts on election day. I skipped the first 12 pages of the sermon <laughs> and now have found some excerpts from somewhere in the middle of this sermon. But those of you who have sometimes noticed we have a reading in our hymn book that says, I call that mind free. Um, that is also a short excerpt from this grand, lengthy, convince the legislators to live up to <laughs> their highest ideal sermon. I'm going to leave the language in the original, which means it's a very gendered way of talking about people. The one or two times when it isn't very gendered male is the times when you're seeing William Ellery Channing being able to transcend the language of his time. Free institutions contribute no, no small degree to the freedom and force of mind by teaching the essential equality of men and their right and duty to govern themselves. And I cannot but consider the superiority of an elective government as consisting very much in the testimony which it bears to these ennobling truths. 
It's often been said that a good code of laws and not the form of government is what determines a people's happiness. But good laws, if not springing from the community, if imposed by a master, would lose much of their value. The best code is that which has its origin in the will of the people who obey it which while it speaks with authority still recognizes self-government as the primary right and duty of a rational being and which thus cherishes in the individual, be his condition what it may, a just self-respect. We may learn that the chief good and the most precious fruit of civil liberty is spiritual freedom and power by considering what is the chief evil of tyranny. I know that tyranny does evil by invading men's outward interests, by making property and life insecure, by robbing the laborer to pamper the noble and the king. But its worst influence is within. The chief cause, curse is that it breaks and tames the spirit, sinks man in his own eyes, takes away vigor of thought and action, and substitutes for conscience an outward rule, makes him an object, cowardly, a parasite, a cringing slave, this is the curse of tyranny. It wars with the soul, and thus it wars with God. We read in theologians and poets of angels fighting against the creator of battles in heaven, the only war against God is against his image, against the divine principle in the soul. And this is waged by tyranny in all forms. This should teach us that civil freedom is a blessing, chiefly as it reverences the human soul and ministers to its growth and power. Without this inward spiritual freedom, outward liberty is of little worth. The worst tyrants are those which establish themselves in our own breasts. The man who wants a force of principle and purpose is a slave, however free the air he breathes. The mind, after all, is our only possession. Or in other words, we possess all things through its energy and enlargement. And civil institutions are to be estimated by the few free and pure minds which they give birth. Now I'm going to skip ahead. A human being is a member of the community, not as a limb or a member of the body or as a wheel, as a part of a machine intended only to contribute to some general joint result. He was created not to be merged in the whole as a drop in the ocean or as a particle of sand on the seashore and to aid only in composing a mass. He is an ultimate being, made for his own perfection and his highest end, made to maintain an individual existence and to serve others only as far as consists with his own virtue and progress. Hitherto, governments have tended to greatly obscure the importance of the individual, to depress the individual, to give him the idea of an outward interest more important than the invisible soul and of an outward authority more sacred than the voice of God in his own secret conscience. Let the individual feel that through his immortality he may concentrate his own being a greater good than that of nations. Let him feel he's placed in the community not to part with his individuality or to become a tool, but that he should find in a sphere for his various powers and a preparation for immortal glory. To me, the progress of society consists of nothing more than bringing out the individual and giving him a consciousness of his own being and, in a, and quickening him to strengthen and elevate his own mind. We now have a song that kind of might fit that from John and James. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in freedom cannot rest, cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Until the killing of a black man, black mother's son, is as important as the killing of a white man. 
White Mother Sod, don't you know that we who believe in freedom cannot rest? No, no, no. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. That which touches me most is that I had a chance to work with people. Passing on to others that which was passed on to me. Don't you know that we who believe in freedom cannot rest? We cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Cannot rest until it comes. Oh, well, I learned as a child there are two ways to see the world as it is and the way it could be. Some people say, that's just not my problem. Some people do what must be done. They see the hole in the fabric that must be so. They see the way blockaded and they roll back the stone. They, they see, see the day beyond the horizon and they do what must be done. Yes, some people do, do, do what must be done. Well, they do what must be done. They see the day beyond the horizon, and they do what must be done. Well, they see the hole in the fabric that must be sewn. They see the way blockaded, and they roll back the stone. They see the day beyond the horizon, and they do what must be done. Now I've seen the toll taken, the tears that were shed. I've seen the journey started and the ripple spread. Some people say that's just not my problem. Some people do what must be done. Hole in the fabric that must be sewn. They see the way blockaded and they roll back the stone. They so see the day beyond the horizon. And they do what must be done. Yes, some people do, do, do what must be done. Well, they do what must be done. They see the day beyond the horizon, and they do what must be done. They see the day beyond the horizon, and they do what must be done. You got to focus on my tie, not my jacket today. <laughs> my brand new, based on Jerry Garcia's painting, tie with swooshes and stars and red, white, and blue. You got to focus on the fact that I'm wearing red, white, and you can't tell, but it's navy blue. Because I'm going to talk about independence because of religion. I'm going to make it quick because I know you're going to want to get your coffee and you're going to want your cupcakes. But I'm going to talk to you about some challenging things I've reflected on since the Supreme Court ruling. We've heard Kevin's presentation on different flags. We've heard John and James singing out loud. We've heard Matthew's playing in the background songs that talk us to us about the beauty from sea to sea of this place. And we heard Channing talking about tyranny. 
Henry Wilder Foote, a Unitarian Universalist known for his historic scholarship, talked about the pilgrims as representing the extreme left wing of English Puritanism. Huh? These are the left wing people. They believed that church and state were separate realms, that their, church rule, their civil ruler had no authority of spiritual affairs, and that every true visible church is joined together by voluntary profession of the faith, and that every church has power to cause to take unto themselves meet and sufficient pers persons in the offices and functions of pastors, teachers, elders, and deacons. They were very anti-hieretical. It wasn't up to the king or the magistrates to determine what was going on. When they came to these shores, they set up a government that was not based on who was landed gentry, who were inherited lords. They instead said, no, we're going to open this up more broadly. We're going to expand the franchise in our churches, and therefore in our governments. You need only have been a church member to be able to vote. Now, some of us today look at that and say, here we go again with all the arguments, this was a Christian nation and blah, 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 blah. No. What they were doing was saying this is not a tyrannical nation. This is not you inherited it. This is not people who had privilege forever get to continue in it. These were dissenters. These were people who said it's not going to be the way it was. And in the 1600s, this was radical. And they only got away with it because they were just barely eking it out on the shores of these lands far away from a king who couldn't enforce anything from that distance, or rarely. Some of the people who stirred up these causes were not just these old Puritan pilgrims. The king, presumably, was being told and believed that most of the dissenters against his rule in, this, in these colonies were Presbyterians. And I guarantee you this Sunday the Presbyterians are cheering that they were labeled as the independent. But it's kind of like lumping them all together with all the dissenters. Anybody who was not Church of England, anyone who was thinking differently. And because in this nation, even in the colonial times, in these, in these shores, there was a whole lot of tolerance, at least, if not embrace, of different religious ideas and people being able to follow what they wanted to follow. You may not believe what the person over there believed, but to some extent you realized, you know what, we got to get along. We have to be able to make it. We have to be able to make it with the Indians among us. We have to be able to make it with the Presbyterians among the Anglicans, we have to make it among the Congregationalists. The Congregationalists who wrote a covenant with one another that lifted up the ideals that even we as Unitarian Universalists now follow, of each congregation being able to make its own budgets, being able to decide its own rule and to rely on one another if we're getting out of line but not with any particular bishop or other looking down on us to tell us what to do. When, when Channing was writing about the tyranny against souls, he was speaking from that tradition that religiously we have to have freedom in order to become our best selves and bring our own best creativity our own promise, our own light into this world, and off into infinity. This undermined the crown, and it helped lead the way for those who would stand up for 
freedom. Yeah, an incremental freedom, a not quite everybody freedom, a definitely not those people freedom, but steps towards getting away from the tyrannies that were forcing down at least some of the individuals and expressing it in a way that echoes through our history. Now, I've got some new, new license plates on my antique cars. Since 2015, the license plates in North Carolina may proclaim first in freedom. Now, I understand from history that they tried that license plate back during the civil rights era, and people were like, what? <laughs> what? North Carolina was first in freedom? Are, aren't we still kind of working on that here? So the new plates have dates on them to help people understand what they're talking about. May 20th, 1775, and April 20th, 1776, for the Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence and the Halifax Resolves, respectively, and when they were signed. It's said that in history that the North Carolina Scots-Irish dissenters in particularly were identified as agitators for liberty in revolutionary times. And there's a piece of history that I love just learning with a book of dissenters that I read from and I have on my shelves. That not buying tea was not enough for the women of Edenton, North Carolina. Do you know this story? People nod. You know North Carolina history better than me. I'm a newcomer. On October 25th, 1774. Do you notice that this is before the 1775 dates? On October 25th, 1774, 51 women gathered in the home of Elizabeth King. They named their group the Edenton Ladies Patriotic Guild. And they wrote and signed a statement about their decision to not buy tea. They explained that they were not just doing it because the men in their lives wanted them to do it, but because they felt it was a duty they owed themselves as concerned citizens. It was the first time in history of the history of the British colonies that women came together to make a public political statement. It was published in newspapers all over the colonies and in England, and it caused strong reactions in every one who read it. Whoa! 51 women signed their names to the bottom of the statement in which they said, they were rebelling against the tea tax and wishing to be patriots. Go North Carolina. Why isn't 1774 on the license plate? Because of all the declarations in North Carolina of the men, they didn't put their names on it. The women did. And they were reviled for having done so. They were told they must not be good mothers if they were involved in politics. There is a strong feminist impulse in North Carolina and in our revolution. Is this a Christian nation? Well, those ladies were members of the Anglican Church. In fact, the wife of the Anglican priest was one of the signers. The men, when they voted in new deacons, then also voted on various patriotic things right there in, in the vestry. People were grounded in their religion in ways that, as a counselor to the king reported back, they may be officially on the books as members of the Anglican Church, but they are no Anglicans. George Washington, in speaking to the Jewish people in Newport, Rhode Island in 1797, said, all possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. It's now no more that than toleration, no more that toleration is spoken of 
as if it was by some indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. For happily, the government of the United States, which gives bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. The United States, which gives bigotry no sanction, persecution no assistance. In the story of the flags, I wonder if we could have George Washington quoted again and again and again. Later in 1797, President John Adams, a Unitarian, <laughs> signed the Treaty of Tripoli, which had been unanimously approved by the US Senate uh, on June 7th of 1797. It secured commercial shipping rights. Basically, they were afraid of the Barbary pirates. And so they negotiated with Muslims in what was then known as, before it was known as Libya, the area back then. And this is the quote of Article 11. As the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion, as it has in itself no character of enmity against the laws, religion, or tranquility of Muslimen, that would have been Muslims, and as the said states never entered into any war or act of hostility against any Mahometan nation, that is, followers of Muhammad, it is declared by the parties that no pretext arising from religious opinion shall ever produce an interruption of the harmony existing between the two countries. You've probably heard that a lot of times, too, as people say this was a Christian nation. To some of the founders of our nations, they were all good Christians, except, of course, the Unitarians, <laughs> who kind of like were like beginning presidents of the nation and signed those documents. And Unitarians and a Universalist signed the Declaration of Independence. And yeah, we won't. We won't talk about that so much in Transylvania County, will we? Benjamin Franklin, in an excerpt before signing the Constitution, also spoke up and said, you know, our Constitution isn't going to be perfect and anything built by men. I'm going to leave the word men in there for those of you who hate that it's always gendered, but in this case, we'll blame the men as being imperfect with all their prejudices, their passions, their errors of opinion, their local interests, and their selfish views. That's what Franklin said. From such an assembly, can a perfect production be expected? No. But he was trying to get people to vote for the Constitution anyway. The Rhode Island held it up. Wouldn't come to the Constitutional Convention, would not ratify the Constitution until we got our Bill of Rights as well because they wanted freedom. And all those Baptists that escaped persecution in Massachusetts and fled to Rhode Island wanted it guaranteed. And those Jewish people in Rhode Island wanted it guaranteed. And the Quakers who had been executed in the colonies wanted it guaranteed. And everybody wanted it guaranteed, the freedom of religion. Consistent with the First Amendment, the nation's answer is tolerance, not coercion. The First Amendment envisions the United States as a rich and complex place where all persons are free to think and speak as they wish, not as the government demands. That's from the closing of uh, opinions of the Supreme Court written by Justice Gorsuch in the 303 Creative LLC case about the woman who had never made a wedding website declaring that she was going to be forced to make one for gay people based on an email that wasn't even written by the person claimed on the email. The Supreme Court reached into a what I think just my own humble self was a, co a case with no standing to lift up something that was echoed in Channing, 
and in some of the others here, that the state cannot impose a tyranny on people on their free speech. I don't like the trend that's happening against LGBTQ rights, and I know that the organization who helped sponsored that case to go before the Supreme Court has very, very different opinions about who should have rights and what values should be upheld in this country than I do, than I think we do. But one of the things that I read in this statement was, one, all those people who argue for state rights, Gorsuch said, you, you can't go against the Constitution. A state can't go against the Constitution. And believe me, it's being argued out there that states can go against the Constitution. And I'm glad that it got ruled that you can't do that. Gorsuch was saying, you can't take away somebody's free speech or their religious impulse. And that's what Channing was saying. You can't do that. So in some ways, I think hidden as a gem in the Supreme Court ruling, we may, in fact, have some freedom. For if what those groups want to take over this country and put their own stamp on it. It may mean that we are pointing back to this most recent ruling to say we Unitarian Universalists can't be forced into ways that are against our religious impulse. You can't do it. May it be that our better angels bring us to a place in which all the flags can fly in which all nations can be respected, in which all peoples can find a way to live with one another on this big blue marble. And especially in Texas, in Florida, in North Carolina, or in any of the states that burned witches at the stake. May we learn better than toleration. May we learn that we're here to help each other grow in our spiritual development as our mission states. Amen. Blessed be. Our final hymn is number 287, Faith of the Larger Liberty. Please rise and join as you're willing and able.
with me in our chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish this chalice flame, daring to carry forward the vision of this free faith, that freedom, reason, and justice will one day prevail in this nation and across this earth. Blessings to all of you. May you enjoy your Independence Day, and may you come back again in love to this place. Amen. 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 Yeah. <laughs>